Chapter 9 of The Hobbit, read to you so you can read along, by David Orchard. Barrels Out of Bond The day after the battle with the spiders, Bilbo and the dwarves made one last despairing effort to find a way out before they died of hunger and thirst. They got up and staggered on in the direction which eight of the thirteen of them guessed to be the one in which the path lay, but they never found out if they were right. Such day as there was, as there ever was in the forest, was fading once more into the blackness of night, when suddenly out sprang the light of many torches all round them, like hundreds of red stars. Out leapt wood elves with their bows and spears and called the dwarves to halt. There was no thought of a fight, even if the dwarves had not been in such a state that they were actually glad to be captured, their small knives, the only weapons they had, would have been no use against the arrows of the elves that could hit a bird's eye in the dark. So they simply stopped dead and sat down and waited, all except Bilbo who popped on his ring and slipped quickly to one side. That is why when the elves bound the dwarves in a long line, one behind the other, and counted them, they never found or counted the hobbit. Nor did they hear or feel him trotting along well behind their torchlight as they led off their prisoners into the forest. Each dwarf was blindfolded. Each dwarf was blindfolded. But that did not make much difference, for even Bilbo, with the use of his eyes, could not see where they were going, and neither he nor the others knew where they had started from anyway. Bilbo had all he could do to keep up with the torches, for the elves were making the dwarves go as fast as ever they could, sick and weary as they were. The king had ordered them to make haste. Suddenly the torches stopped, and the hobbit had just time to catch them up before they began to cross the bridge. This was the bridge that led across the river to the king's doors. The water flowed dark and swift and strong beneath, and at the far end were gates before the mouth of a huge cave that ran into the side of a steep slope covered with trees. There the great beaches came right down to the bank, till their feet were in the stream. Across the bridge, the elves thrust their prisoners, but Bilbo hesitated in the rear. He did not at all like the look of the cavern mouth, and he only made up his mind not to desert his friends just in time to scuttle over at the heel of the last elves, before the great gates of the king closed behind them with a clang. Inside, the passages were lit with red torchlight, and the elf guards sang as they marched along the twisting, crossing, and echoing paths. These were not like those of the goblin cities. They were smaller, less deep underground, and filled with a cleaner air. In a great hall, with pillars hewn out of the living stone, sat the elven king on a chair of carven wood. On his head was a crown of berries and red leaves, for the autumn was come again. In the spring he wore a crown of woodland flowers. In his hand he held a carven staff of oak. The prisoners were brought before him, and though he looked grimly at them, he told his men to unbind them, for they were ragged and weary. Besides, they need no ropes in here said he. There is no escape from my magic doors for those who are once brought inside. Long and searchingly he questioned the dwarves about their doings, and where they were going to, and where they were coming from, but he got little more news out of them than out of Thorin. They were surly and angry, and did not even pretend to be polite. "'What have we done, O king?' said Balin, who was the eldest left. Is it a crime to be lost in the forest? 
to be hungry and thirsty, to be trapped by spiders. Are the spiders your tame beasts or your pets, if killing them makes you angry? Such a question, of course, make the king angrier than ever. And he answered, It is a crime to wander in my realm without leave. Do you forget that you were in my kingdom, using the road that my people made? Did you not three times pursue and trouble my people in the forest and rouse the spiders with your riot and clamour? After all the disturbances you have made, I have a right to know what brings you here, and, if you will not tell me now, I will keep you all prisoner until you have learned sense and manners. Then he ordered the dwarves each to be put in a separate cell and to be given food and drink, but not to be allowed to pass the doors of their little prisons until one of them at least, until one at least of them was willing to tell him all he wanted to know. But he did not tell them that Thorin was also a prisoner with him. It was Bilbo who found that out. Poor Mr Baggins. It was a weary long time that he lived in that place all alone and always in hiding, never daring to take off his ring, hardly daring to sleep, even tucked away in the darkest and remotest corners he could find. For something he to do, he took to wandering about the Elven King's palace. Magic shut the gates, but he could sometimes get out if he was quick. Companies of wood elves, sometimes with the king at the head, would from time to time ride out to hunt or to other businesses in the wood, and in the lands to the east. Then, if Bilbo was very nimble, he could slip out just behind them, though it was a dangerous thing to do. More than once he was nearly caught in the doors as they clashed together when the last elf passed, yet he did not dare to march among them because of his shadow, although tiny, uh, sorry, thin and wobbly as it was in torchlight, or for fear of being bumped into, and discovered. And when he did go out, which was not very often, he did no good. He did not want to, he did not wish to desert the dwarves, and indeed he did not know where in the world to go without them. He could not keep up with the hunting elves all the time they were out, so he never discovered the ways out of the wood, and was left to wander miserably in the forest, terrified of losing himself, until a chance came of returning. He was hungry too outside, for he was no hunter, but inside the caves he could pick up a living of of some sort by stealing food from store or table when no one was at hand. I am like a burglar that can't get away, but must go on miserably burgling the same house day after day, he thought. This is the dreariest and dullest part of all this wretched, troublesome, sorry, tiresome, uncomfortable adventure. I wish I was back in my hobbit hole with my own warm fireside with the lamp shining. He often wished too that he could get a message for help sent to the wizard, but that of course was quite impossible, and he soon realised that if anything was to be done, it would have to be done by Mr Baggins alone and unaided. Eventually, after a week or two of this sneaking sort of life, by watching and following the guards and taking what chances he could, he managed to find out where each dwarf was kept. He found all their twelve cells in different parts of the palace, and after a time he got to know his way about very well. What was his surprise one day to overhear some of the guards talking and to learn that there was another dwarf in prison too in a specially deep dark place he guessed at once of course that that was Thorin and after a while he found that his guess was right at last after many difficulties he managed to find the place when no one else was about and to have a word with the chief of the dwarves Thorin was too wretched to be angry any longer at his misfortunes, and was even beginning to think of telling the king all about his treasure and his quest 
which shows how low-spirited he had become, when he heard Bilbo's little voice at his keyhole. He could hardly believe his ears. Soon, however, he made up his mind that he could not be mistaken, and he came to the door and had a long, whispered talk with the hobbit on the other side. So it was that Bilbo was able to secretly, to secretly message so it was that Bilbo was able to take secretly Thorin's message to each of the other imprisoned dwarves, telling them that Thorin, their chief, was also in prison close at hand, and that no one was to reveal their errand to the king, not yet, nor before Thorin gave the word. For Thorin had taken heart again, hearing how the hobbits had rescued his companions from the spiders, and was determined once more, not to ransom himself with promises to the king of a share in the treasure until all hope of escaping in any other way had disappeared, until, in fact, the remarkable Mr. Invisible Baggins, of whom he began to have a very high opinion indeed, had altogether failed to think of something clever. The other dwarves quite agreed when they got the message. They all thought their own... Sh they all thought their own shares in the treasure, which they quite regarded as theirs in spite of their plight and the still unconquered dragon, would suffer seriously if the Wood Elves claimed part of it. And they all trusted Bilbo. Just what Gandalf had said would happen, you see. Perhaps that was part of his reason for going off and leaving them. Bilbo, however, did not feel nearly so hopeful as they did. He did not like being depended on by everyone, and he wished he had the wizard at hand. But there was no use. Probably all the dark distance of Mirkwood lay between them. He sat and thought and thought until his head nearly burst, but no bright idea would come. One invisible ring was a very fine thing, but it was not much good among fourteen. But of course, as you have guessed, he did rescue his friends in the end, and this is how it happened. A stream flowed under part of the lower, lowest regions of the palace and joined the forest river some way further to the east, beyond the steep slope out of which the main mouth opened. Where this... page won't load. Interesting. Like it's going to load. Where this underground watercourse came forth from the hillside, there was a water gate. There the rocky roof came down, close to the set surface of the stream, and from, and from it a portcullis could be dropped right to the bed of the river to prevent anyone coming in or out that way. But the portcullis was often open, for a good deal of traffic went out and in by the water gate. 
If anyone had come in that way, he would have found himself in a dark, rough tunnel, leading deep into the heart of the hill. But at one point, where it passed under the caves, the roof had been cut away and covered with great oaken trapdoors. These opened upwards into the king's cellars. There stood barrels and barrels and barrels, for the wood elves, and especially their king, were very fond of wine, though no vines grew in those parts. The wine and other goods were brought from far away from their king's folk in the south, or from the vineyards of men in distant lands. Hiding underneath, uh, sorry, hiding behind one of the largest barrels, Bilbo discovered the trapdoors and their use, and lurking there, listening to the talk of the king's servants, he learned how the wine and other goods came up the rivers, or overland, to the long lake. It seemed a town of men still throve there, built out on bridges far into the water as a protection against enemies of all sorts, and especially against the dragon of the mountain. From Lake Town, the barrels were brought up the forest river. Often they were just tied together like big rafts and poled or rowed up the stream. Sometimes they were loaded onto flat boats. When the barrels were empty, the elves cast them through the trapdoors, opened the water gate, and out the barrels floated on the stream, bobbing along until they were carried by the current to a place far down the river where the bank jutted out near the very eastern edge of Mirkwood. There they were collected and tied together and floated back to Lake Town, which stood close to the point where the forest river flowed into the long lake. For some time, Bilbo sat and thought about this water gate and wondered if it could be used for the escape for his, of his friends. And at last, he had the desperate beginnings of a plan. The evening meal had been taken to the prisoners. The guards were tramping away down the passage, taking the torchlight with them and leaving everything in darkness. Then Bilbo heard the king's butler bidding the, ch the chief of the guards good night. Now come with me, he said, and taste the new wine that has just come in. I shall be hard at work tonight clearing the cellars of the empty wood, so let us have a drink first to help the labour. Very good, laughed the chief of the guards. I'll taste with you and see if it's fit for the king's table. There is a feast tonight, and it would not do to send up poor stuff. When he heard this, Bilbo was all in a flutter, for he saw that luck was with him, and he had a chance at once to try his desperate plan. He followed the two elves until they entered a small cellar, and sat down at a table on which two flagons, two large flagons, were set. Soon they began to drink and laugh merrily. Luck of an unusual kind was with Bilbo then. It must be potent wine to make a wood elf drowsy, but this wine, it would seem, was the heady vintage of the great gardens of Dorwinion, not meant for his soldiers or his servants, but for the king's feasts only, and for smaller bowls, not for the butler's great flagons. Very soon the chief guard nodded his head, and then he laid it on the table and fell fast asleep. The butler went on talking and laughing to himself for a while without seeming to notice, but soon his head too nodded to the table, and he fell asleep and snored beside his friend. Then in crept the hobbit. Very soon the chief guard had no keys, but Bilbo was trotting as fast as he could along the passages towards the cells. The great bunch seemed very heavy to his arms, and his heart was often in his mouth in spite of his ring, for he could not prevent the keys from now from making, every now and then, a large clink and clank, which put him all in a tremble. 
First he unlocked Balin's door and locked it again carefully as soon as the dwarf was outside. Balin was most surprised, as you can imagine, but glad as he was to get out of his wearsome little room. He wanted to stop and ask questions and know what Bilbo was going to do, and about, and all about it. No time now, said the hobbit. You just follow me. We must all keep together and not risk getting separated. All of us must escape or none, and this is our last chance. If this is found out, goodness knows where the king will put you next, with chains on your hands and feet too, I expect. Don't argue, there's a good fellow. Then off he went from door to door, using his following until his following had grown to twelve, none of them at all any any too nimble, what with the dark and what with their long imprisonment. Bilbo's heart thumped every time one of them bumped into another or grunted or whispered in the dark. Drat this dwarvish owl racket, he said to himself. But all went well and they met no guards. As a matter of fact, there was a great autumn feast in the woods that night and in the halls above. Nearly all the king's folk were merry-making. At last, after much blundering, they came to Thorin's dungeon far down in a deep place, and fortunately not far from the cellars. Upon my word, said Thorin, when Bilbo whispered to him to come out and join his friends, Gandalf spoke true, as usual. A pretty fine burglar you make, it seems, when the time comes. I am sure we are all forever at your service, whatever happens after this. But what comes next? Bilbo saw the time had come to, ex to explain his idea as far as he could, but he did not feel at all sure how the dwarves would take it. His fears were quite justified, for they did not like it a bit, and started grumbling loud. In, fr in started grumbling loud in spite of their danger. We shall all be bruised and battered to pieces and drowned too, for certain they muttered. We thought you had got some sensible notion when you managed to get hold of the keys. This is a mad idea. Very well, said Bilbo, very downcast and also rather annoyed. Come along back to your nice cells and I will lock you all in again and you can sit there comfortably and think of a better plan. But I don't suppose I shall ever get hold of the keys again, even if I feel inclined to try. That was too much for them and they calmed down. In the end, of course, they had to do just what Bilbo suggested because it was obviously impossible for them to try and find another way out into the open upper halls or to fight their way out of, out of gates that closed by magic. And it was no good grumbling in the passages until they were caught again. So following the hobbit, down into the lower cellars they crept. They passed a door through which the chief guard and the butler could be seen still happily snoring with smiles upon their faces. The wine of Dor Winion brings deep and pleasant dreams. There would be a different expression on his face, on the face of the chief guard next day, even though Bilbo, before they went on, stole in and kind-heartedly put the keys back on his belt. That will save him from getting in Get, that will save him some sort of some of the trouble he is in for, said Mr. Bilbo's to himself. Mr. Bilbo. That will save him some of the trouble he is in for, said Mr. Baggins to himself. He wasn't a bad fellow and quite decent to the prisoners. It will puzzle them all too. They will think we had a very strong magic to pass through all those locked doors and disappear. Disappear? <laughs> We've got to get busy very quick, if this is going to happen. Balin was told off to watch the guard and the butler were given warnings if they... St Balin was told off to watch the guard and the butler and give warning if they stirred. The rest went into the adjoining cellar with the trap doors. There was little time to lose. Before long, as Bilbo knew, some elves were under orders to come down and help the butler get the empty barrels through the doors into the stream. These were, in fact, already standing in rows in the middle of the floor, waiting to be pushed off. 
Some of them were wine barrels, and these were not much use, as they could not easily be opened at the end without a great deal of without a deal of noise, nor could they easily be secured again. But among them were several others, which had been used for bringing other stuffs, butter, apples, and all sorts of things to the king's palace. They soon found thirteen, with room enough for a dwarf in each. In fact, some were too roomy, and as they climbed in, the dwarves thought anxiously of the shaking and the bumping they would get inside, though Bilbo did his best to find straw and other stuff to pack them in as cosily as, he could, as could be managed in a short time. At last, twelve dwarves were stowed. Thorin had given a lot of trouble and turned and twisted in his tub and grumbled like a large dog in a small kennel, while Balin, who came last, made a great fuss about his air holes and said he was stifling, even before the lid was on. Bilbo had done what he could to close holes in the sides of the barrel and to fix on all the lids as safely as could be managed, and now he was left alone again, running around, putting the finishing touches to the packaging, packing, and hoping against hope that his plan would come off. It had not been done a bit too soon. Only a minute before or two after Balin's lid had been fitted on, there came the sound of voices and the flickering of lights. A number of elves came laughing and talking into the cellars and singing snatches of song. They had left a merry feast in one of the halls and were bent on returning as soon as they could. Where's old Galleon the butler? said one. I haven't seen him at the tables tonight. He ought to be here now to show us what is to be done. I shall be angry if the old slow coach is late, said another. I have no wish to waste time down here while the song is up. Ha! Ha! came a cry. Here's the old villain with his head on a jug. He's been having a little feast all to himself and his friend, the captain. Shake him, shake him, shouted the others impatiently. Galleon was not at all pleased at being shaken or waken, and still less at being laughed at. You're all late, he grumbled. Here I am waiting and waiting down here while you fellows drink and make merry. And forget me your tasks. And forget your tasks. Small wonder if I feel fell asleep from weariness. Small wonder, said they, when the explanation stands close at hand. Could give you a taste of your street sleeping draught before we fall to. No need to wake the tur turnkey yonder. He has had his share by the looks of it. Then they drank once more and became mighty merry all of a sudden, but they did not quite lose their wits. Save us, Galleon, cried some. You begin your feasting early and muddled your wits. You have stacked some full casks here instead of the empty ones, if there is anything going by weight. Get on with your work, Grum get on with the work growled the butler. There is nothing in the feeling of weight in an idle tosspot's arms. These are the ones to go and make no others. Do as I say. Very well, very well, they answered, rolling the barrels to the opening. On your head be it, if the king's full butter tubs and his best wine is pushed into the river for the late man to feast on nothing. Roll, 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 rolling down the hole. Heave, ho, splash, plump, down they go, down they go. They sang as first one barrel and then another rumbled to the dark opening and was pushed over into the cold water some feet below. Some were barrels ready empty, some were packed neatly, some were tubs neatly packed with a dwarf each, but they all went down. So they all went, one after another, with many a clash and a clump and a bump, thundering, thudding on top of the ones below, smacking into the water, jostling against the walls of the tunnel, knocking them one into another. Then 
It was just at this moment that Bilbo suddenly discovered the weak point of his plan. Most likely you saw it some time ago and have been laughing at him, but I don't suppose that you would have done half as well yourself in his place. Of course, he was not in a barrel himself, nor was there any way to pack him in, even if there was, had been a chance. It looked as if he would certainly lose his friends this time. Nearly all of them had been already disappeared through the dark trapdoor and get utterly left behind and have to stay lurking at the potential lurking as a potential burglar in the elf caves forever. For even if he could have escaped through the upper gates at once, he had precious small chance of ever finding the dwarves again. He did not know the way home by the lake to the place where the barrels were collected. He wondered what on earth would happen to them without him, for he had not had time to tell the dwarves all that he had learnt, or what he meant to do, once they were out of the woods. While all these thoughts were passing through his mind, the elves, began, be, the elves beginning very merry, being, uh, while all these thoughts were passing through his minds, the elves, being very merry, began to sing a song around the river door. Some had already gone to haul on the ropes which pulled up the portcullises at the water's gate, so as to under, so as to let out the barrels as soon as they were all floated below. Down the swift dark stream you go, back to the lands you once did know, leave the halls and caverns deep, leave the northern mountain steep. Where the forest wide and dim stoops in shadow grey and grim, float below the world of trees, out into the whispering breeze, past the rushes, past the reeds, past the marshals waving weeds, through the mist that rises white, up from mere and pool at night, up the heavens cold and steep. Sorry, follow, follow stars that leap up the heavens cold and steep. Turn where dawn comes over day, over rapid, over sand. South away and south away, seek the sunlight and the day. Back to pastures, back to mead, where the king and oxen feed. Where the berry swells and fills under starlight, under hill, under starlight, under day, south away and south away, down the swift black dark stream you go, back to lands you once did know. Now the very last barrel was being rolled to the doors. In despair, and not knowing what else to do, poor little Bilbo caught hold of it and they were pushed to the doors, in, desperate, in despair, and not knowing what else to do. Poor little Bilbo caught hold of, of it, and was pushed over the edge with it. Down into the water he fell, splash, into the cold, dark water, with a barrel on top of him. He came up again, spluttering and clinging to the wood like a rat, but for all his efforts, he could not scramble on top. Every time he tried, it was every time he tried, the barrel rolled round and ducked him under again. It was really empty and floated light as a cork. Though his heads were full of water, he could hear the elves still singing in the cellar above. Then suddenly the trapdoors fell to with a boom and their voices faded away. He was in the dark tunnel floating an icy water all above. He was in the dark tunnel floating in icy water all alone, for you cannot count friends that are all packed up in barrels. Very soon a grey patch came in the darkness ahead. He heard the creak of the water gate. 
being hauled up and he found that he was in the midst of a bobbing and bumping mash, 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 mass of casks, casks and tusks all pushing together to pass under the arch and get out into the open stream. He had as much as he could do to prevent himself from being hustled and battered to bits. But at last the jostling crowd began to break off and swing away one by one under the stony arch and for and under the stony arch and away. Then he saw that it would have been no good even if he had managed to get astride the barrel, for there was no room to spare, not even for a hobbit, between its top and the sudden sloping roof where the gate was. <laughs>